I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. I always like to joke around and say, you could have been at home watching Dancing with the Stars, right? <laughs> so I appreciate you taking some time out of your evening. And obviously, we have some baseball fans in the house. But if you're not a baseball fan, don't feel bad because I have a lot of uh, information in my presentation that, that surrounds baseball, but it's not baseball. So we try to have something for everyone. And <clears throat> let's see, I guess we're going to start the PowerPoint and get the first screen up there, first uh, PowerPoint. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. And when they, when they queue up the PowerPoint, you'll see some of this. I actually started off uh, in elementary school collecting baseball cards. And that was my initial introduction into baseball history. Now, I have to go back a little further backwards. I'm getting a little feedback. But I started off actually in 1964 collecting Beatles cards. And you probably remember the Beatles. Everybody knows the Beatles, right? Well, I was caught up in the craze uh, about the Beatles, and I was just having a good time with the Beatles. And I made a mistake of being a second grader taking my cards to school, my Beatles cards. And the teacher said, these are not collectibles. She looked at them as toys, and she took my Beatles cards. I know, that's cruel, isn't it? <laughs> And so I decide I'm going to get some more of these Beatles cards. I go back to the store and there is no more Beatles cards. Every, the only thing left was baseball cards. And so I started buying baseball cards. And uh, uh, that was the beginning of me understanding baseball history. Um, you know, I bought, I would see these like the Fleer cards. That had, I don't know if anybody collectors in here, but I had the Fleer cards with all the the greats from the baseball history. And then of course I'm learning about baseball players. I'm also uh, learning a little bit about foreign language because I remember uh, I was I had a card and I thought the guy's name was Jesus Alu. <laughs> because I had no one trying to transfer that. I'm just a third, fourth grader trying to figure this out. And I watched the game of the week and I think the Pirates were playing and, and he was playing in the game and they said, hey Zeus Alu. I said, oh, that must be how you spell Jesus in Spanish. And so I was learning Spanish, too, and, uh, and a lot of the great nicknames and everything. But anyway, this kind of like, uh, I like to bring it back to, to the cities where I'm presenting because it always seems more interesting when we do that. So since we're in Jefferson City tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about Jefferson City. Okay, let me try the first slide here. Let's see if I can get it going here. See where I point it. Where do I point it? There, somewhere. I don't know where to point. Oh, it's not. That might help, wouldn't it? Ah, there we go. Okay, wrong direction, but we got it going. All right. And still continuing about me, just quickly so you'll know. Uh, that's me with my baseball cards there in the 70s. And uh, you know you love your baseball cards when you start taking pictures with them. And guys, I had a little more hair back then. And uh, then uh, in 1985, there's a picture of me with James Coupapa Bell, who lived in St. Louis. And they consider Coupapa Bell the fastest runner that ever played baseball, as far as, you know, speeding around the bases. And Satchel Page always said he was he was so fast, he could turn out the lights and get in the bed before the room got dark. <laughs> so I had a chance to hear from the man who was actually that fast, and he told me how that story came about. And of course, I played baseball in my life, and I had a favorite player, and it was Dick Allen. And uh, you might remember, some might remember him as Richie Allen. Uh, very controversial, and I tried to copy him, and he got me kicked off more teams. <laughs> And so we had a laugh about that, and I had a chance to meet him, and uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. And I always wore number 15 when I played, and you know, we only had so many uniforms, and if we had that number 15, I mean, I would beat up any kid that wanted 15. I had to have it. That, uh, that, was, that was my baseball legend, and uh, what's interesting is he missed getting in the Hall of Fame in 2020 by one vote. Now, what, what wasn't on my bio is that when they selected the people to be on the ballot, I was on the group that selected the pre-1950s. 
So I had all the Negro leaders on mine. And uh, so I couldn't vote for Dick Allen, but I was a part of the committee who put the uh, list together. I made sure I got Buck O'Neill on there. And uh, I, tried, I got John Donaldson on there, but he didn't get in. But uh, I tried very hard. But anyway, that's just a little bit about me. And one last thing, uh, this is uh, me with Buck O'Neill as my youngest son. My youngest son, well, Buck O'Neill was six foot two. My youngest son is now six foot four. So he'd be much taller than Buck. And, uh, and that's uh, one of the QR codes. My new book on Buck O'Neill has QR codes. And they're from an interview done in 1985. And what's interesting, there are a lot of people talking about Buck O'Neill. But no one knew him longer no one has a photograph with him that predates mine, right? And uh, no one has an interview that predates the interviews that I was doing with Buck in the 1980s. Uh, the first documentary he ever did, did was not done by Ken Burns, it was done by me in 1987. But of course, I'm no Ken Burns, so nobody knows my book, right? But we did a lot of first, and this book has QR codes. It's the first time QR codes have been used in a book where you can actually hear the person's voice. And so we're, we're blazing a lot of new trails all the time. And uh, my first book came out in 1992, so I'm celebrating the 30th year of being published. So we're out there. And then I might want to mention a few of the Kansas City Monarchs that come from Missouri. And uh, you might recognize some of these cities here, maybe even some of the players. Um, Bo Mason made it to the uh, major leagues with the Phillies from Marshall. He's still alive, by the way. Um, Hop Bartley from Centralia. Let's see what. Uh, J. Burr Ray, he was a World War I veteran uh, from Lexington. Frank Duncan from Kansas City. James Stark from uh, Springfield. And then, actually, in 1948 and 53, the Monarchs recruited these players from here. Now, I don't know what became of them but they actually lived in Jefferson City. And they had a chance to suit up with the Monarchs and wear the Monarch uniform during the late 40s and the 50s. And of course, during the 40s, uh, they had people like uh, Hank Thompson, Willard Brown, um, uh, Gene Baker was with them, Elston Howard. So they were, they were suiting up with some pretty good ball players, so they must have been pretty good themselves. But most people don't get a chance to see a list like this surrounding around Missouri. And of course, uh, Missouri has some great baseball history. Uh, there's a team called the Browns Tennessee Rats. They weren't from Tennessee. They were from Holden, Missouri. And uh, the Browns Tennessee Rats uh, were a very interesting team in that they traveled from 1907 to about 1922. And what they would do is they would go into town. This is before night baseball. and so. They would play a baseball game in the daytime, and at nighttime, they would have a minstrel show. And they had musicians in the band. And matter of fact, uh, Brown, the leader of the uh, Browns Tennessee Rats, was a trumpet player, corn, the cornet back then. And, uh, and so they had a few people that I've been able to identify. Plunk Drake was from, uh, he's from uh, Sedalia, and uh, the other ones were from, from Holden, or parts of Missouri. and. Uh, so some of these guys, not only did they play baseball, but they played musical instruments. And uh, I know that, uh, Brown's wife, she did all the cooking, and I remember uh, interviewing one of the widows of a, a player who played for the Browns Tennessee Rats, and she said she was known for her tough steaks. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, John Donaldson. John Donaldson, I don't know if you've heard of him last year, there was a statue erected for him in front of the park in Glasgow, Missouri. And John Donaldson, I pushed hard for him to get in the Hall of Fame. We've already found, we've found over 5,000 strikeouts, but now I'm collecting over 2,000 hits. And I'm gonna make another bid for John Donaldson in about two years. So every three years we get a chance to bid for some players to get in the Hall of Fame. So, I'm going to shoot for John Donaldson. I'm trying to get new information to tell a new story. Uh, but John Donaldson, born in Glasgow, a uh, very famous pitcher, and uh, a darn good one, a left-handed uh, pitcher. And you see how long he played. Right? 
1911. Actually, <coughs> actually, in my Dizzy Dean book, I talk about him uh, because he was pitching in 1911, the year that Dizzy Dean was born. And then he pitches against Dizzy, Dizzy Dean in 1934 in the Monarchs <laughs> So this guy was around for a long time, died in Chicago, and uh, so that's a name you might want to remember, John Dobson. Well, if you hold those questions, I'll get them at the end, okay? And I, I try to let everyone know that we're all baseball fans, whether you know it or not. And one of the ways that we're baseball fans is through nicknames. We, we hear these nicknames, so if I was to say Mickey, well, who would you say? Man, okay. And say, if I would say Yogi. Barry. Yeah, uh, what if I say Shoes? Yeah, Joe Jackson. Joe Jackson. And what if I say Pee Wee? Yeah. It's always a Pee Wee Herman fan in every audience. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we're always talking about Pee Wee Reese, right? I, I was somewhere and a 90 year old lady said Pee Wee Herman, and that threw me. <laughs> but because of these nicknames, it hemmed me into the game because I started in Kansas City. And uh, we had, at that particular time, um, people like Catfish Hunter and Blue Moon Oldham, um, Camping Campaneers. They had all these nicknames with these A's players. And I didn't know anybody named Catfish. I didn't know anybody named Blue Moon. And I thought it was interesting. And hey, I'm, I, I, I'm trying to think, well, I know Catfish Hunter's first name. I'm trying to think of Blue Moon Oldham's first name. Oh, it's John. Yeah. But that's, nicknames were a part of the game. And if you think about it, the Royals catcher right now is who? Starting catcher. Salvi Perez. Hmm? And his nickname is? Salvi. Salvi. What kind of nickname is that? They just shorten the name and say you got a nickname. In the old days, if you were playing baseball, there would be some old guys on the bench. They would look at how you walked, how you talked, what you ate. They knew where you came from. And they had all of that information, and that's how you got your nickname. There was a guy in the Negro Leagues, um, and he started out in Montgomery, Alabama. And he came out with shags and fly balls, and uh, two old guys were sitting on the bench, and they were watching him shag, old balls, fly balls. And one of the guys said, you know that guy, he runs with his chest stuck out. And the guy said, he looks like a turkey, doesn't he? <laughs> He said, yeah, we'll call him Turkey. His name is Turkey Stearns. He's in the Hall of Fame today as Turkey Stearns. That's how easy it was to get a nickname. But that's a lost part. But that was one of the fun parts of baseball. Right? And of course, I write how Dizzy Dean got his nickname in the book, too. That's a whole story right there. So, and of course, if I say the babe, everybody knows, right? And then I thought I'd mention a few games that I know that were played here. And I just picked up another game in the 60s. I'm going to have to find that one, too. Because Satchel Page came here. Uh, Satchel Page went everywhere, guys. And I'll tell you a little bit about Satchel Page. But these are some games. The Monarchs first started coming here in 1922. And they played the prison team at that time. Interesting thing, the guy pitching for the prison team was from my hometown, Kansas City, Kansas, Andrew Skinner. I knew exactly who he was when I saw his name. And uh, I think he murdered his girlfriend. And, uh, but I thought it was in Kansas. I don't know how he got in jail in Missouri. But anyway, he was in the prison. And so when I look at the prison, I, uh, the battery, usually I can tell some of those guys because they were pretty good players before they came. And uh, probably the most uh, famous guy, uh, his, oh, shucks. His name was Jackson. He was in the, in the penitentiary in, in Lansing. Anybody remember Jackson? Well, Fireball Jackson. You ever heard of Fireball Jackson? If you get home tonight or you are taking notes, remember the name Fireball Jackson. This guy was so good that he got arrested and put in prison, and the Major League teams kept him on their roster, hoping that he'd get out. And every time he got out, he'd go right back in. But he was a big league pitcher, undoubtedly. And uh, he was pitching for the prison team at Lansing. So Fireball Jackson. One of the greatest prison pitchers ever lived. So anyway, this is a little bit about the Monarchs coming here. And as you see, they played some town teams, the Jefferson City Eagles here. Uh, then they had a Redbird team, uh, Jefferson City Dodgers. Have you heard any of these teams, anybody? Any of these teams? Uh, there's probably still some old guys around who might have played for them or their parents played for this team. And so this is just a little bit of the local history.
And because of, when you research, you can find a lot of information. Uh, one of the things was, I have a ledger that belonged to Andrew Ruth Foster, who was the president of the league. And he kept records of how much money was made every place the team played in the league because they had to pay him a cut. So he kept excellent records. And from Ruth Foster's book, you can see they played in Jefferson City. Uh, this was uh, 1922. When they played, the, and then they played in Boonville, Sedalia, they played in Marshall. Can you imagine that? The Monarchs playing all these places, 1922. And if you take that $70.30 adjusted for inflation, that's $982. So, uh, but this is talking about the Monarchs, and they played at Lincoln Park. I don't know if Lincoln Park is still here. No. No, not there. Okay, and uh, what's interesting is when they mention parks in small towns, Usually they don't give the address because everybody in town knows where the park is. So it makes it difficult for me, but you guys are really helping me because I can ask, is that park still there? Is it not? It's been gone for 400 years. But there are lots of records to prove that these teams came and how much money they made. Uh, I will show you one thing. People say, why did they, why would they come to Jefferson City? Well, if you notice, they played the St. Louis Stars. And if you notice the game on the third, the Monarchs took tape for that game was $29. And if they came to Jefferson City, they made $70. Wouldn't you come back to Jefferson City? <laughs> and that was a league team. They made $29, right? St. Louis must have been an awfully tough place to play. And also, most of it, it looks like we got a good age range in here. Most of us grew up listening to baseball on the radio. And so you had to know how to talk baseball. And what's happening now, I'm finding out a lot of young people, they don't know how to talk baseball. They're watching baseball on TV, but they, they don't hear the words. So they can't talk baseball. So I was listening one day, uh, Denny Matthews with the Royals announcing, and he said that play went 6-4-3. And I said, he just lost a whole lot of young people. Because if you never kept score, you have no idea what he just said. And a lot of the terms, you would think that young people would know these terms, uh, batted around, solo home run. I asked one kid what happens in the bullpen, they had no idea. And, and they were, they, he said he was a baseball fan. Uh, clean up batter, that throws them, uh, can't tell the difference between a pennant and a world championship. And, uh, and the one that even throws some of the veteran people is a cup of coffee. Did that, did that throw anybody? Yep. A cup of coffee, that's someone who was in the big leagues, but they might only play one or two games. So they had a cup of coffee. coffee. Yeah. And they set them on their way. And, and right now, uh, when you get to be September, you're going to get a lot of guys who are going to come up for a cup of coffee. They won't be there. So anyway, if you know some of those terms, you know a little bit about baseball. And some of those terms have seeped into our culture. So, you know, uh, if you're in business and you give a good presentation, they say, hey, he hit a home run. <coughs> um, uh, 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 let's see, what's in the, uh, actually, I'm trying to think of another one. I'll think of another one and I'll come back to it. But anyway, I don't know what you know about the Kansas City Monarchs, so I'm just going to give you a quick history lesson on the Kansas City Monarchs. They were organized in 1920 as charter members of the New Negro National League. And uh, every team in the league, of course, was black. And all the owners were too, except for one team. And it was the Kansas City Monarchs. And they had two white owners, Tom Baird and J.L. Wilkinson. Now, Tom Baird, he always went by the initials T.Y. Baird because he didn't want anybody to know his real name. And his real name was Thomas Younger Bear. <coughs> so you put Younger with the state of Missouri, what do you get? Oh, God. Those are his relatives. Matter of fact, I write in the Dean book, I give you the correct chronology of his relatives. Because they, they all came. Dean, Dean came, was born in Arkansas, and so was Tom Bear. And they were good friends. So Tom Bear traveled around. Interesting thing about Tom Bear, in 1922, the governor of Kansas did an investigation. He wanted to know how much the Ku Klux Klan had infiltrated the state of Kansas. 
So he put people undercover to go to the various organizations and report back to them with the, the name of everybody who was a member. And Tom Baird was a member of the Kansas City, Kansas Ku Klux Klan, but he owned the Kansas City Mars. So Tom Baird comes from my hometown, and I probably know more about Tom Baird than anybody. And his daughter was always a big supporter of mine, and Harriet Wickstrom, so uh, most of the information I got it from Harriet. So anyway, we also had J.L. Wilkinson, and J.L. Wilkinson was from Algona, Iowa. Tom Baird was, Tom Baird was from Pinnacle, Arkansas, and then he moved to Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, Bear, uh, Wilkinson was from Algona, Iowa, and uh, uh, he was a, a pioneer in race relations. So you have one man who was secretly with the Ku Klux Klan and the other guy who was a pioneer of race relations. Uh, actually, uh, Wilkinson was a pioneer of gender relations, too. He uh, believed that women ought to be playing baseball, and the first team he organized was the Bloomer Girls. <laughs> and he had an all-women team playing hardball, and he had three guys who dressed up like women who did the pitching. <laughs> now, don't ask me where they went to use the restroom. <laughs> that, that's a political statement. Y'all catch that? Yeah, that was J.L. Wilkinson and his first team, and then later on he organized the All Nations, and he put all nationalities together, and they traveled on one Pullman car. So we had uh, white players. Uh, as a matter of fact, Virgil Barnes got in and played with the New York Giants. Uh, he had John Donaldson was his great pitcher. He had Jose Mendez, the, the famous uh, Cuban, uh, who's in the Hall of Fame. Um, and the first ever Japanese professional baseball player ever in history played for J.L. Wilkins with the All Nations. So that was J.L. Wilkinson. If you've never seen a picture of J.L. Wilkinson, that's him right there. And that's a picture of Tom Baird uh, and his wife on their wedding day. And of course, there's John Donaldson in the middle we saw earlier, talk about the Bloomer Girls. And then Tom Baird was a baseball player in, our, in my hometown, uh, playing for Pete Brothers. And uh, he used to operate a park. Uh, you know, uh, Proctor and Gamble is in our hometown, Kansas City, Kansas. And so they had a baseball park, and it was called Big and Bubble Park, and Tom Baird operated. Actually, uh, Jack Johnson, I mean, remember the boxer Jack Johnson? Uh, he was in prison in Leavenworth. When he got out of prison, the first place he went was to do a boxing max, an exhibi exhibition in Big and Bubble Park. So. And then, of course, I don't know how much you know about Wilkinson, but he left us with two things to remember. The first one was bus travel. The first entertainment to ever travel by bus was the Kansas City Monarchs. Before then, everybody was on the train. And that was uh, 1926. And then also, uh, in 1930, he, was, he had been tinkering around with it since about 1911, and it was night baseball. He believed that baseball should be played at night. And it could be played at night, and people were working. In the daytime, they could come to a game, uh, especially in the rural communities, farmers. You know, they're not going to be working after dark, right? So they could come to the game. And so he was a pioneer of night baseball. And uh, if you can imagine, in the major leagues, um, Ben Johnson said that night baseball will never last. It's just a passing fad. And J.L. Wilkinson said that lights will be the baseball with talkies or the movies. And the movies had just started talking with Al Joseph's The Jazz Center in 1926. So we know who was right on that, right? And because of that, J.L. Wilkinson is in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. I just saw his plaque two weeks ago, and I, I this is maybe three weeks ago, when I was up in Cooperstown for Buck O'Neill's inauguration. And of course, when you think of the Kansas City Monarchs and you think of great pitchers, what's the first name that comes to mind? Satchel Page. But Satchel Page doesn't get to the Kansas City Monarchs until 1939. But remember, they were organized in 1920. Who was their great player? It's Wilbur Bullet Rogan. I talk about him everywhere I go. He was born in Oklahoma City and raised in my hometown, Kansas City, Kansas. I, I'm always Billy of my hometown. But uh, Rogan is from there. And uh, I'll show you how great, I think Rogan is the greatest all around baseball player who ever lived. And I tried to prove it in one of my books that I wrote about Rogan. But, when, when people talk about baseball and they talk about the greatest all-around baseball player, that's someone who can hit and pitch, who do they normally say in the big leagues? Can hit and pitch. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth, right. So 
So how would Rogan compare with Ruth? And I just give a few, this is probably the only statistics I'm going to give tonight, but as a uh, starting pitcher, Rogan won over 400 games. He struck out over 2,000 men. Uh, in addition, he also invented a pitch called the palm ball that he uses to change of pace. He was threw really hard. And people are still using palming the ball today and using his change of pace. Uh, in addition, he was a 300 hitter. And uh, he hit over 400 home runs that I've been able to document. And that's inside and outside of the league. And he was also a 10 second man, which means he could run the 100 yard dash in less than 10 seconds. Now somebody knows Babe Ruth couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but that was Willie Bullet Rogan. And because he could do all of those things, he too is a member of the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. So he's in Cooperstown, just saw his play a couple of weeks ago. And so that's Wilbur Rogan, and right now with Shiny Otani hitting home runs and pitching well. Uh, first they started comparing him to Babe Ruth, but man, people who read my book and other guys who are based by historians, they got on the line and they start talking about Willie Rogan, saying, how can you not look at this guy? And so Willie Rogan is getting more mentioned now because of Shiny Otani than he was before that. So anyway, that's him right there. And of course, he married a form girl from Conquer City, Kansas. And I like to put up this picture. The only thing I can say about the picture, her name is Kathy, is I would hate to be sitting behind her in church. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here's a few of the all-time greats. And uh, I think there's Turkey Stearns. I gave you his nickname, Play for the Monarchs, Play for the Detroit Star. There's Coo Papa Bill. Uh, and these guys would play in the California Winter League. They play in Cuba, play in Puerto Rico, uh, Dominican Republic. Coo Papa Bill played in the Dominican Republic. And of course, there's Newt Allen here, the great Kansas City Monarchs second baseman. In my Buck O'Neill book, uh, Buck O'Neill compares Newt Allen to Frank White back in 1985 when Frank was still playing, uh, who he thought was the best. And no one's ever heard that kind of debate. And of course, people often ask me, did Babe Ruth ever play against uh, any of the black teams? And he did quite a few times. And in um, 1922, he came to Kansas City, and uh, he played uh, against the Kansas City Monarchs. He had four hits that day, all singles. But then he decided he wanted to pitch, and one of the Kansas City Monarchs players, Oscar Heavy Johnson out of Atchison, Kansas, hit a home run off of Babe Ruth. And just to prove it wasn't a fluke, Carl Mays came in the next week. I don't know if you know these names, Carl, Carl Mays. Uh, he, uh, when I was growing up, I used to read baseball, but he hit Chapman. And the only time that a guy ever got killed by a hit, by being hit by a pitch ball, Carl Mays was the pitcher. Anyway, Oscar Johnson hit one off of Carl Mays the next week after that. And so, uh, so many stories I could tell you about Babe Ruth, you probably heard of quite a few. One of my favorite is, uh, <coughs> In 1927, Babe Ruth made over $200,000. Uh, that's playing baseball. He had all kinds of endorsements. And uh, every team in the league chipped in to pay his salary. And so at the end of the year, somebody asked Babe, they said, do you know you made more money than the president of the United States? And Babe said, why not? I had a better year. <laughs> <laughs> that's Babe Ruth. And if you have young people, if you're introduced them to baseball through Babe Ruth, they, they, it's, it's fun, it's fun. And, and that's how I was introduced in the third grade to baseball. And they talked about uh, Ruth eating so many hot dogs and all this kind of thing. If they had to say he had 714 home runs, I wouldn't know if that was good or bad. But they said he ate 21 hot dogs between the double header. I didn't know what a double header was, but I knew what 21 hot dogs were. So it got me, so I'm sure to catch everybody else. And this is just a, a slide of the lights give you an idea. The Kansas City Monarchs lights were portable. The first time that uh, night baseball was played in a major league field, when I was growing up, they said it was Cincinnati's crossing field in 1935. Well, actually, uh, Grover Cleveland Alexander with the House of David uh, using the Monarchs lights played a game in crossing field in 1931. But the Monarchs lit up Pittsburgh's Forbes Field in 1930. So, uh, that's, you know, we've kind of had to rewrite that history. And of course, the first modern day night baseball game was uh, not the Kansas City Monarchs. It was a team called the House of David. And they were playing in uh, Independence, Kansas against, I think it was called the Independence uh, 
promoters or something like that, and uh, which was a minor league team, but their lights were permanent. But the Monarchs actually had the portable lights and they played the next week. And then when the lights first came about, they were extremely popular. Everybody wanted to see these night baseball. They had never seen it before. And people were excited. It was, it, was, it was such a novelty. So they came out to the game out of thousands. Even though it's the depression, they don't have the money, but they're still playing for baseball and night baseball. And so by 1933, 34, the night the lights had started to wear off as a novelty. So the Kansas City Monarchs were still traveling. So they had to come up with new ways to get you to the park. And one of the things they did was to hire celebrities to come to the ballpark. And so uh, they had uh, Jim Thorpe, and these are names we grew up with. Jim Thorpe, would you believe a lot of young people don't know who Jim Thorpe is? I have no idea. And uh, so Jim Thorpe would come, and uh, they played against the Monarchs in different parts of the country. If people, if you wanted to see Jim Thorpe, in the 1930s, you could see him on a baseball field. And uh, also, uh, Jesse Owens, after the uh, Olympics in 36, he was running exhibitions, but what they would do is they would have Jesse Owens come and say the Monarchs might play a doubleheader or a single game. They would have a farmer bring out his best horse, and they would mark off a certain territory, and Jesse Owens would race the horse and beat the horse. Now, you know a man can't really beat a horse around. But what they did was, it took a horse a minute to get up into a gallop, and a man can get out of the block, especially Jesse Owens, a lot faster. So they had it marked. And so when the horse got up in the gallop, Jesse Owens would cross the finish line right before the horse. And people paid big money to see this all over the country, to see Jesse Owens. Um, then also, in 1931, Grover Cleveland Alexander came, you can say, out of retirement, and he signed up with a team called the House of David. And uh, the House of David was a religious organization out of Benton Harbor. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a new documentary that just came out. It's called Life Everlasting, because the people in the House of David thought they were never going to die before Jesus comes. Of course, they're all dead, <laughs> in, including the leader who said that. We thought he was like the seventh messenger. Now what's interesting is, uh, when the documentary, there's only one black guy in the documentary you're looking at. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm talking about the baseball team, but I always found it really fascinating, the House of David. So Benjamin Parnell was, was the leader. And when Benjamin Parnell died, they encased his body in a glass sarcophagus. So the members could come and, and look at it. And uh, would you believe he's still in there? And there, they have some ladies who come by and fix him up. He used to have a diamond necklace on, and by, when he died, it was worth about maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars somewhere in that range. And of course, worth more than that. But in 1970, someone broke the glass and stole the the diamonds. They never found the diamonds, but they rebuilt the glass, and they still come in and fix him up. I'm about to go and uh, march. I'll be in Benton Harbor. Uh, I'm not planning to go see Benjamin Point. Nobody thought that was funny, but <laughs> it's the truth. But they had Grover Cleveland Alexander. Grover Cleveland Alexander would come out and pitch one inning. And people would pay big money. And especially ball players, they just lined up because if you play for a local semi-professional team, and you can tell your grandkids, you know, I've got a hit off of Grover Cleveland Alexander. So everybody wanted to play, and they had big crowds. And Grover Cleveland would come, and he'd pitch one inning, and maybe two, and he'd go sit out. Well, some nights Grover couldn't pitch those one or two innings. And uh, well, what I would have to tell you is uh, he was known to take a hit. And uh, so some nights he wasn't up to it. There's a great movie, and, and you, you'll probably notice this. His name is Grover Cleveland Alexander. So you know he's named after a president. And when they made his lifetime, his life story, uh, about 1950, 51, Ronald Reagan, who was our 40th player's president, played Robert Cleveland Alexander. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? But yeah, great pitcher. And of course, they had Babe Dickerson, who used to come out, considered one of the finest female athletes of the entire 20th century, and most young ladies don't know who she is. Um, 
I had, I've educated a lot of young people who she was. She was a professional baseball player playing with the House of David. She made $1,000 a month coming in and pitching in one and two innings. Uh, she was known for her spitball and Burley Grimes, who was the last person who could legally throw a spitball in the major leagues. He said her spitball was better than his. And uh, in addition, um, she, was, uh, uh, she won gold medals in the Olympics. Uh, she was a basketball player, that's where they originally saw her. Never went to college, but she was in the Olympics. So if somebody knew that she could run. And she uh, was a professional golfer, as a matter of fact. I have uh, uh, Babe Dickerson putter. I, I bring with me all the time. She's got her name right here on, on the putter. So you can still find some of these things out there through the magic of um, social media. You can still find them. But Babe Dickerson is one of them. And of course, she played for the House of David. It's a female playing with men, playing baseball. Okay, this is a picture of the House of David. And uh, I have to explain uh, to young people, these are not hippies from the 1960s. <laughs> this is 1930, and their whole religion was centered around some of these scriptures. This is why they didn't cut their beards. And uh, they had some really great players who played for them. But if you go online and you put in House of David, you can see some really wonderful clips uh, through YouTube and things like that. They look like Major League Baseball players today. <laughs> That's true. Actually, whenever a ball player grows a beard, you'll hear an announcer say, he looks like he plays for the House of David. They kind of go retro, but House of David, fascinating history. And guys, there's no end to the House of David because uh, pictures. Because if you went and if you joined the House of David, they tried to find a specialty for you. And there was a guy who joined the House of David who had his own photography studio. So when he joined, he said, you're going to become a, a keeper of photographs. And there are thousands of photographs of the house, I mean, literally thousands, that you can find out there. So they're well, well documented in movie and in images. So this is just one. So uh, with some really good players. And of course, um, most people don't know this, but I try to share this every time I get down in the Jefferson City. Most of you've heard of Ernie Banks. And Mr. Cub, let's play two, right? And, uh, and, uh, but most people, he's a Hall of Famer, by the way, most people don't know that his first game he ever played for the Monarchs was played in Jefferson City. He played at Ernie Vivian Field. It, it probably still was. There. It's, it's still there? It's still there. It looks like that deserves a plank. Somebody needs to get busy, right? But uh, yeah, the first time he played, but he put on a monarch uniform, and he played that year, and then he had to go to the service. He came back in 1953, played part of the season, got midway through the season, and the Cubs signed him and took him straight from the Kansas City Monarchs to the major leagues. He never played one game in the minor leagues, and the rest is history. So Mr. Cub, I guess he was Mr. Jeff City now. Uh, great history, and I had a chance to meet Ernie, uh, really nice guy. Uh, I've had a chance to meet a lot of baseball players over the years. Um, I, I tell you one of the more fascinating, how many people remember Hank Bauer? Hank Bauer? Hank Bauer, I, I used to cover the Royals before I went to work for them. I, I wrote for a local newspaper, and Hank didn't like being behind the glass at Royal Stadium. He, he liked the fresh air. So he came over where us peons were, right? Uh, we didn't have the major league credentials, right? But we were writing for papers. And he would come over there and we'd always talk baseball. And he knew that I knew a lot about baseball. And he would always ask me, say, are you still collecting that baseball dope? That's what he called it. And uh, he had such great stories. And when you talk to Hank, Hank used to curse every other word. And, and then I would see somebody would come out to the booth and they wanted to interview Hank Bauer. And he talked for 10 minutes and never said a curse word. I said, Man, that's amazing. <laughs> One of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. Uh, a former, I think he was a, a former Marine and all that kind of stuff. But he was a true baseball man. And uh, one story, I'll tell you one story, uh, because this guy played for the Monarchs, was Elston Hall. And uh, Hank told me that one day Casey Stengel called a meeting. And all the Yankees were there. And they only had one black player on the team, which was Elston Harper. And so Casey called the meeting. They don't know why they're having a meeting. And he said, uh, Casey opened the meeting. He said, I want to announce. He said that 
we have one black guy, and he's the slowest black guy ever. <laughs> and I started thinking about it, you know, and that, that, was, that was a Hank story, and I started thinking about it. I said, so was he that slow? Hank said, he was, you wouldn't believe how slow this guy ran. Now he later on became an MVP, I think 1964 or something like that. So I went home that night, and I opened up the encyclopedia to see how many bases he stole. And uh, he stole eight bases in 15 years. <laughs> but Hank Bobble was the one who tipped me off, and I never thought to look at Elston Howard's stolen bases. But at that time, a lot of the black players coming in were just speed beams. They were, you know, setting major league stolen base records and all that. But uh, the Yankees got one black guy, and he couldn't run. But he could hit. And how about this one? Did you guys know that he invented the donut that you put on the back? Yeah, Elston Howard invented it. So uh, he had a patent on it, and, uh, and a couple of companies picked it up before he could get his patent on it and uh, started selling it themselves. But yeah, it's pretty well known that he invented the donut, and people are still putting donuts on bags today. That's just now. And that kind of concludes what I want to do. We just touched on a lot of different things. And I always try to end with some poetry, so I'm going to end with some poetry tonight. I do want to thank you for coming. And hopefully I didn't hold you too long. Uh, there's a lot of good history out there. Uh, you know, I've been writing about it uh, for 40 years now. And uh, I've still got some more things coming. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of books. When I first started, there were maybe five books, maybe, maybe 10 at the most on the Negro Leagues. Now there's 500. But you have to be careful, though, because some of those books are the same cup of coffee you won't know. <laughs> You've got to be careful what you buy. I always say go to the library, and if you're a book collector, read the books first, and if you like it, go buy it. That's what I say, because some topics, there are just too many books, and all books aren't created equal. How about that? So you pick what you like. So I'm going to end with some poetry tonight, and um, then I'm going to turn it back over. Now we have a quick question to answer, okay? And. Uh, uh, one of my favorite poems is uh, The Stars That Did Not Shine. And I've recently heard this as a song, and I listened to it for a while. I said, that would make a better poem. So I said, let me reinterpret it and add a few of my own little flavor to it. But it's called The Stars That Did Not Shine. And it goes something like this. My name is John Buckle O'Neill. My name is Norman Turkey Stearns. My name is Wilbur Bully Logan. But my age is way beyond. I spent my prime in baseball shoes, but my sporting days are gone. Now I'm just one more forgotten face among the black faced teams. An old dark horse that came to court, they called the Negro Leagues. Now I walked the fields in Tennessee, but I dreamed of better days. So I left the plow, the picking bag, to join the homestead grays. And all summer long we played the states to travel south for fall. Who rain and dust, we rode the bus so we could play baseball. We played for love and we played for pride and we seldom made much more. The bread, the beans, the hotel books, the roads were crowds don't roll. The all night wise, the seedy side came with the life I chose, but we made do when we came through. God damn it, we were pros. And we played the shadow of the babe, Lou Gehrig, and the rest, then stayed behind that big league fence, why they were called the best. But we played them well, and we gave them hell with every hidden pitch, then stayed behind that color line and watched those guys get rich. But did they see Josh Gibson swing or sack and throw a stuff? Or can you imagine how bad it feels when your best is not good enough? When clouds roll in across the sky to hide the brightest moon, it's then you'll find some stars don't shine. Some folks were born too soon. So God bless you, Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays, and all. You wore our numbers on your back when you played big league ball. And every time you hit one out, slid or laid one down, you carried us from that old bus to the halls of Cooperstown. Now, my name is John Buck O'Neill. My name is John Donaldson. My name is Willie Brown, but you might not remember that. I'm just one more along the school who played with ball and bat. But when you seek out heroes and you praise our great pastime, remember those old brown faced pros, the stars that did not shine. Thank you. <laughs>